Om Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langhaya Tegiri Yat Krapa Tammaham Vande Paramananda Madhavam Right, let's um, project the text. Oops, where is the text? Here we are. So Shall we. What we, chapter, please? 17. We begin with 17 today. Finally. Thank you. Yes, it's actually fitting to your presentation on three gunas because this will be exactly about this. About three gunas. Okay, let's start with the verse. Arjuna vacham ye shastra vidhim utsrijya yajante shradhayan vita te sham nishtha tuka Krishna Satvam Aho Rajastamaham Shri Bhagavan Vacha Trividha Bhavati Shraddha Dehinam Sa Svabhavaja Satviki Rajasi Chaiva Tamasi Chetitam Shrunu. So, three gunas. Ye Shastra Vidhimutsrijya and those who do not follow Shastra, Yajante Shraddhayan Vitaham, but still sacrifice full of faith and belief, let us say this way, devotion. Tesham Nishtha Tuka Krishna. What is the knowledge of them or foundation for them? Uh, nishtha can be translated in many ways, but it's like a foundational knowledge. Um, o Krishna, Sattvam Aho Rajas Tamah. What is Sattva, what is Rajas, and what is Tamas, so to say? Is it Sattva, Rajas, or Tamas? So the question is that if somebody doesn't know the religion, the rules, what to do, what to follow, but with his faith, and love and devotion for the divine makes the sacrifice. How can you describe that um, kind of offering as sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic? So Arjuna still wants to know the rules because he's kshatriya, he wants to follow the prescription. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what is right and I will do it. Um, Shabinda translates, Arjuna said, when men sacrifice to God or gods with faith, but abandon the rule of the Shastra, what is, the, uh, what is that concentrated with will of devotion in them? Nishtha. Interestingly, Shabinda translates Nishtha as concentrated will of devotion in them, which gives them this faith and moves them to this kind of faction of Krishna. Is it sattva, rajas, or tamas? Quick, quick question. Yep. Uh, that means this devoted, this concentrated will of devotion can be sattvic, can be rajasic, or tamasic. Yeah. Yes. So, how will it manifest if it is tamas? It's a will of devotion. How does it manifest as tamas? Well, that is the question. And the answer is following. So you will receive your answer in the next. Sri Bhagavan Vacha, the Blessed Lord, said, Trividha, of three kinds, Bhavati Shraddha, there is faith. Oh, the faith is of three kinds in embodied beings, Dehinam. Sa, Svabhavaja. It is born from Svabhava, 
from their own need of development is of a triple like all things in nature and varies accordingly to the dominating quality of their nature, sattva, rajas, or tamas, hear thou of these. So this kind of nature, shraddha, nature of our faith or belief can be sattviki, sattvik, rajasik, and tamasik. Rajasi and tamasi, shraddha. Yeah? That's why this long e, because it's feminine gender, shraddha is feminine gender. So they describe Shraddha. And then he will give us examples. Sattva Nurupa Sarvasya Shraddha Bhavati Bharata. The, yes, Shraddha Mayo Yam Purusha Yoyat Shraddha Sa Evasah. The faith of each man takes the shape given to it by his staff of being, or Bharata. This Purusha, this soul in man, is, as it were, made of Shraddha, a faith, a will to be, a belief in itself and existence, and whatever is that will, faith, or constituting belief in him, he is that, and that is he. It's amazingly perfect description, psychological description of everyone. If you look around, not only at yourself, but at other people, you will see sometimes very strange and not fitting behavior. You would not go for that, or you would not uh, highlight this, or you would not consider that to be important, or this to be important. <laughs> And this is because everybody believes in something else, has a different drive. Drive to this will to be, interesting, will to be taken from nature. What is this drive from Schopenhauer? What is this drive, will to be? Everybody is somehow, it's like a vector of direction of development, which creates all our movements, gathers them like, like a directional power, like a drive which moves us all and selects and collects all those elements on the way in a particular constellation. We receive certain answers, we receive certain directions, certain knowledge and so on. It's amazing how will to be is doing all that. For example, uh, the, I saw recently the, the map of the geese flying over the Pacific Ocean, 14,000 kilometers, miles or something, 10,000 miles, incredible. And they fly through the whole ocean, through the middle. What is that? What is that will to be <laughs> doing to them? <laughs> so that's what they are. And they don't sit there and wait for the better weather or hide somewhere in the bushes. They're not making it different from their will to be. I, some, someone said once so beautifully, without this will to be, with this, without this Shraddha, we would not be able even to make a step forward physically. We would not be able to walk. <laughs> we need that will to be. It is everywhere, in physical, vital, mental, in everything. This is Shraddha. So what Shraddha in, in the man, whatever the Shraddha, that is the man. Man is determined by his Shraddha. And Shraddha is determined by Svabhava. It is born from his need of development. His soul demands certain experiences, certain knowledge, certain discoveries for itself. It learns from this world and this 
um, set set up how to be, and it drives it in a particular form and way. So many of us believe in different things in different periods of our life. When I was young, I believed in something. Then I was older, believed in something else, and so on. So we are constantly choosing the constellations, but there is a drive, invisible drive, which at the end of our life will be more or less perceived or understood. What was that about? Can, can we say the Yuvatman knows how is how is going to be our life? It's, it's like more, it's more psychic, yeah, than Yuvatman. It's like a destiny. The Yuvatman knows the destiny of the human life. I think it's more psychic, more antaratman than jivatman. Jivatman has all infinite capacity because it's unborn self. It can select all the in kind of support for whatever development, yes? It can draw from the infinity all the qualities, all the powers. But um, uh, psychic has a particular aim or plan of development. It wants to grow, to evolve. And that is the drive for Swabhava. Jivatma is already fulfilled, as it were. Psychic, the projection of this Jivatma is still to be fulfilled in manifestation. That is the difference. One does not, one, the Jivatman looks at the world as already embodied divine, as as everything is the divine. This is the look of the Jivatma. Everything is the divine. Even the end of the world, even the most ugly things which we consider with our mind to be inappropriate. For him, it is a part of the divine. He then doesn't he judge. For the psychic, for the psychic. Um, uh, for the psychic, it's quite different. For the psychic, the instrument is the nature. And here he's describing what constitutes nature. Right. And for the psychics, a quite different. Psychic, uh, how to say, if the Jivatma looks at everything as the divine, psychic looks for only the divine. It wants only the divine. And it doesn't find the divine here and find it because it, it works in nature. And in nature, there are many things which have to be transformed and changed. So it wants the divine only. And that's why it is much more effective for us in this manifestation than Jivatma. Jivatma would accept everything as already divine and everything else is maya, illusion. <laughs> it's an illusion. We have to wait till illusion is over and then we go. Or we go immediately into some samadhi and never come back. That's it. This is the difference between jivatma and uh, antaratma. Antaratma looks at everything, <laughs> seeks only the divine. And Jivatma sees everything as the divine. And by the way, Shubhendra says that both of these are necessary for integral yoga. Can you imagine you have one spiritual look from above at everything as the divine already? You have nothing to judge here. Everything is in its right place, doing its right movement. And the other part in the heart is looking only for the divine does not accept anything, accepts nothing but the divine in nature. And that is its transformative power. It will never leave anything be as it is. But Jivatma leaves everything be as it is. That's the difference. The, the Antaratman is like a child? Like a child. Like it a is child. a child with a purpose, with a concrete purpose, to experience the divine. 
Yes, its purpose to find the divine in nature. It looks for it everywhere. It calls to it. It calls to the divine, loves the divine, looks for it everywhere. And uh, first, we have to find that being in us. And second, when bring it forward. And from that time, it will start looking for the divine in everything. And that is the spiritual transformation. When you start seeing the divine in nature, as Sri Aurobindo was in Alipur jail, saw the divine in everything, in everyone. It was there. He could see it. He could, he could connect to it. And this is the psychic view. So the spiritual presence of the Jivatma, who is supporting everything as the divine. Notice this kind of dialectical movement. One is seeking for the divine, other supports the divine. So these two come together in one being, and you have that spiritual realization. But it's process, a very beautiful the, thing. Hmm? The process really is an inner transformation because he, he, the, the Antaradman needs to understand or needs to realize everything is the divine, but he can see yet. Right. It, it sees everything as the divine, but it is unborn self. It is not interested in manifestation much. It is not uh, participating it, in it much. Yeah? It accepts everything as already the divine. It sees the divine in darkness, in the unconsciousness. It sees it everywhere as the divine. Doesn't judge. Doesn't judge the end of the world. Doesn't judge the war, the mis misbehavior and all that which we judge. And why we judge with our mind vital and physical, why we do judge, yeah? because there is someone in us who does not accept it and wants this to be the divine. But of course, it will be distorted by the shortcomings of the mind, shortcomings of the vital. It will hijack that drive in us and start judging people. Yeah? in judging events, and we are constantly doing it. But the judgment can be purified more and more by the psychic presence. Psychic is judging, always. Well, I'm exaggerating a bit. Judging in the positive way, not in the negative way. Looking for the divine, finding the divine, relying on the divine and not on the outer kind of crust of the unconsciousness. It makes sense. Yeah, we, we know that it is so, yes? We, we feel it in our life, why we are judging others. And many times we hear this, don't judge and you shall not be judged. But it is more about wrong judgment of the mind. But uh, the positive judgment of the psychic is very different. Mother was very judgmental, by the way. She was absolutely psychic in that sense. She could tell you what it is you know, without any hesitation. And you will be shocked to know. <laughs> and that was like that. So what to do? You cannot just wishy-washy with, with manifestation. You have to change it. You have to be the divine and not to pretend to be something. So these two attitudes are fundamental for our yoga. Between them, if we have them both, we have a super balance. There is one more, of course, level is the energy in the, at the bottom of things, Kundalini Shakti the center of our will, if that center also joins our heart and our above the head mind, higher minds, levels of the mind, then we are totally complete.
So uh, Vladimir, this uh, this uh, Shraddha that has been spoken of here, this Swabhava, is that coming from the psychic being or is that? Absolutely, like it oh. is. Swabhava is the power of the psychic being, which wants to achieve certain uh, experience, certain development in this world. It has a plan, a vision, a need. Swabhava is that need to achieve it, to realize it. In our course on 12 qualities, we gave the task for uh, participants to check on themselves and to discover that first need they had when they were children. They had something there at the beginning, some pure need. They, they can still feel that this is the drive of all their incarnation. Whatever they do, they will be looking for that particular bhava, particular experience or shift or change, and that is attracting them most. Whatever they do, they may do all different things, but they will be constantly looking for that and exercising it. It's amazing. It doesn't matter where we are. We can be in very comfortable conditions or totally uncomfortable in the in the concentration camp, yeah, doesn't matter. There also we will be looking for it, as we are looking here in this more comfortable world. It is something which souls wants to get, and it will be looking for it, recognizing it in all different relations, and will try out many things to figure out where, where is that bhava, which I want to experience, how it works in this world, how it could be maintained and manifested after all, because though that bhava is the divine bhava. It wants to know how it is settling here, working out in manifestation. And the whole life span is spent for this, for Svabhava to be realized. Any example, any interesting example that came forth from the participants they shared with Svabhava? Somehow they were not very much into it. <laughs> we were kind of trying to inspire them, but they didn't find it um, very appealing. They said, no, did, said, yes, yes, lovely. Yeah, that makes sense. But it requires an inner work. Try to find your Svabhava. I can share mine. Please, that would be so wonderful. I would love to hear that central, that quintessential drive of your life. Yes, because I have felt it right from the beginning. I felt it there as a child. I felt it when I was a teenager. I felt it when I was a young mother. I seek it every time, everywhere. I sought it in my work. I sought it in my relationships. And the one word that um, can perhaps point at it is perfection. I wanted to be a perfect human being without knowing what it meant at that time in my life. When I was young, I remember I prayed to be perfect in everything, but I didn't know what that meant or how to get there. But it was an inner need. I don't know how it just became an inner need. And, um, and then as I grew, I realized now when I look back, I realized, yes, all my life I have just sought that perfection in beauty, perfection in work, perfection in relationship. And sometimes this uh, seeking for perfection made me have very high expectations of the other. You know, because I sought perfection in my environment. So I realized that I also had very high expectation that the other person is also a perfect person. And if not, then, well, I'm going to have problems here with that person. So, you know, now when I look back in my old age and I think about it, I realized that that was the purpose and that is the purpose. And for that, I'm willing to put myself on the line for everything. Wonderful. 
I mean, just I just I don't want to take up too much time sharing about no, myself. No, no, no. This is this is fundamental. Uh, sometimes we do not know how to call that the drive. We feel it. We we can give many names to it. We can describe it from many different angles. You describe it from one perfection. You feel that it is present. That word perfection, that concept, is yeah. present in all particular views on this thing which you experience as a need. Um, and now I see everything is already perfect. Everything is perfect already. It's just that my perception needs correcting. Mm. You see, my you added something interesting here. That might be, might be, even some other name can be given to it, to mm -hmm. your Swabhava drive. Mm -hmm. Perfection could be instrumental to something which was actually wanted to be experienced. Well, I, I do not know. I, I know in my case, for example, I was thinking about this deeply. What was driving me? It is um, uh, an adventure. I was always adventurous. <laughs> when I was a child, I, was, I loved adventures. I wanted unknown. I was seeking the unknown. I, unknown was attracting me. Everything which was impossible was it attracting me. But maybe it's also instrumental <laughs> to something which I cannot even express. You know, I'm still doing it. I'm I'm welcoming uh, ignorance. I love ignorance because ignorance is the beginning of knowledge, true knowledge, not this kind of camouflaged pretending to know everything. No, I have to be ignorant. I have to accept my mm, incapacities uh, myself, not to show to others, but when I do it, I feel free. Maybe it was a search for freedom, you know, for real freedom through the, through the, these elements of, you know, accepting the unknown adventure, not being afraid of darkness and incapacity. Maybe this higher claim is there behind. I do not know. Well, if you have some other thoughts, somebody please share. It would be wonderful. Maybe we will fulfill our course on 12 qualities here. <laughs> I can share, I can share a little bit of my life here too. I'd like to, uh, from, from, from childhood, probably three, four or five years old, um, I always wanted to take dance classes. I always wanted to know about movement. Unfortunately, I had a mother who would never allow me to take dance classes. And so I would just dance in my bedroom alone all by myself <laughs> growing up. And finally, in my teenage years, I was able to take dance classes and um, uh, in a, a workshop uh, one summer. And then I realized, yes, this is what, you know, but I was already 15, 16 and uh, a little bit too old to really be a professional dancer or anything like that. Then I took, went to college, took dance classes and I uh, uh, found yoga, Hatha yoga. And I really uh, became very, very interested in that and started doing Hatha yoga and taught Hatha yoga for probably uh, 12, 13 years. And then um, it just continuously looking and searching for uh, a, a dance. I, I needed to find a certain kind of dance. It wasn't ballet. It, it wasn't tap. It wasn't jazz. It wasn't um, any dance that I could see um, uh, outwardly in life at that time. And I finally, through the integral yoga, finally found this, what I call the dance of life. And uh, this is the, the perfect um, dance for me, just searching for this dance throughout my whole life. And I finally found it with Shirobindo and Mother. Amazing, yes. uh, this, and you can call it by many names. One of the main names I call it is the dance of surrender. But then of course, there are many, many, many other ways that Mother describes this dance. There was uh, somewhere on the, I put on the Facebook uh, one girl dancing 
behind the backs of all the elders, people who are watching on the stage, some, some famous dancer, and she cannot come through because there are so many crowds, she cannot see this, but she hears the music. And behind their backs, she is totally ecstatically small girl. She is dancing like a queen, like a, like a goddess, you know. And nobody sees her. She doesn't need anybody to, <laughs> to see her. She's not dancing for them. <laughs> they are all there somewhere on the stage. It was so touching me as that I thought, this is, this is a real life. This is a swabhava, <laughs> swabhava of this girl. She wants to give herself fully in every movement to the beauty, to the delight. Um, yeah. Exactly. Precisely. Perfectly said, Vladimir. There's, there's a little verse in the next chapter, chapter 18, uh, one of the most famous verses um, on... It's better to die in one's own dharma than, to, however poorly done, poorly performed, than to live in someone else's dharma. Yes. Then he says, "Swabhava niyatam karma," in the same term. So, yes. "Swabhava niyatam" one's uh, own. Paradharma uh, bhayava. Bhayava. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it, it's better to follow one's own nature imperfectly than to follow someone else's because another person's dharma can bring um, or fear. Fire. Yeah, it can bring fear or, or fearful events, events to be avoided. Better to be, yeah. yes, better to follow one's own dharma, though it leads you to death and destruction, than yeah. to follow the dharma of others which lead you to success. Yeah. So this kind of trying to succeed through imitating other successful people, which is not you. Uh, at the end, it leads you to, to the empty, because you came with the need of the soul. Now you've betrayed your soul and you go for something for the external, you know, uh, achievement, so on. So in that sense, of course, uh, this is Svadharma. Svadharma is the projection of Svabhava. Yes, if you found the way to combine both the outer activity and life activity with the need of the soul, if you found that more or less perfect, mm -hmm. then you are lucky man. Because then you fulfill your plan of your uh, psychic being. And that's what we are here to do. So when we take some other dharma of some great yogi or something and want to be like him, it's maybe for the future plans of our soul sometimes, yeah? not for today. For today, we still have to fulfill that dancing girl. You know? yeah. It is still dancing somewhere there inside, <laughs> looking for light. You know, the most beautiful arcanum in 22 arcanum you know the mysterium of the occultism yes 22 laws the last one is called the divine mother and the last card 22nd yeah it's realization of everything so there is a naked girl a woman dancing and the right hand touches the sky and the left foot touches the earth, and she is in this full sunlight. You know, there is nothing to hide. There is a total realization of the divine in nature. The divine mother reveals all her secrets, combines heaven and earth in one movement. This is the highest. And I, I'm sure that all these, our uh, Svabhavas, they lead to the highest. Yeah? Only we have to find that path. It's one element which is needed, but that element also as a path is a path to the Supreme. Yeah. Please remind us how Sri Aurobindo translates Svabhava. 
Svabhava and Svadharma. He has beautiful, uh, the whole chapter in there on Svabhava yeah. and Svadharma. Svabhava is one's own nature uh, or that which drives. I can give you exact if you want. Yeah, so, well, I, I mention it because I know whatever he says will contrast with the conventional translation. For example, the first hit I came up with when uh, when I looked for Svabhava Niyatam Karma, that, the, that term in uh, chapter 18, verse 47, uh, was Prabhupada's, which is prescribed duties. Svabhava is one's prescribed duties, which is not at all <laughs> what, what Sri Aurobindo translates. You know, it's, it's following one's scriptural duties or socially ordained duties rather than one's inner oh, yeah. uh, drive. Well, he doesn't like the duties word altogether. Yeah. This was mainly yeah, interpreted by other uh, kind of thinkers, yes. Mm -hmm. And so Svadharma, Svabhava, Svadharma is one's own duty right. to the society, which cannot be true, you know. Svadharma relates to your own being and not to your duty. But concentrating on that, I was just wondering, isn't it also because it's one aspect of the manifestation, so wouldn't it also be a limitation if we cannot break that barrier at the end and include something at a higher level, like all, where all swabhavas integrate or something like that? Because uh, we can start to begin with that, but just it's one element of the manifestation, so it is limiting by its nature. Of course, it is limited by the intention of the soul coming here to experience. You cannot experience everything because the the soul is still growing, and uh, it needs uh, elements to 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 combine in its own full self development. I found this the the explanation for Svabhava from Sri Aurobindo was looking for it. There is the whole passage. We already read this in mm -hmm. chapter eight. Aksharam Brahma Paramam Svabhavo Dhyatma Muchyate. Svabhava is Adhyatma. Svabhava says Sri Aurobindo. Wait a minute. Um, is the principle of the self, Adhyatma, the principle of the self, operative as the original nature of the being, own way of becoming. It's a, it's a literal translation of sva, one's own bhava becoming, or causing to be, one's own way of becoming. And this proceeds out of the self, the akshara, from the transcendental self. So everyone has his own way to be, you know, and to become. And that has to be seen, valued, acknowledged, supported, loved by all. Yeah? Everyone is so different, <laughs> so uniquely different. I'm not getting on my nerves, you are, but you are not like me or like fitting for me. You know? Yes, I will get on your nerves, definitely, because I am becoming differently than you. So could you say the psychic being is one's sense of one's uh, swabhava, how to tune to one's swabhava? Right. It is actually that adhyatmic nature, which is projected from the unborn mm -hmm. self, from jivatma, that projection into the nature of becoming is swabhava. So, and every time we, and when, whenever we disregard that swabhava due to our attraction towards other things and, you know, getting attracted by somebody else's swabhava, we disregard our own, we actually set ourselves up for disappointment and suffering. Yeah, then but we why would we get uh, attracted if there is not some element of that in our own growth? Because no, we, if it is something completely different, then we wouldn't even feel attracted towards it. If the very fact that we are getting attracted to it, that means it has some purpose in our evolution too. Sure. 
Sure, sure. Definitely, I agree with you there, but it is not the purpose. We do have some affinity towards beauty, towards movement. We have all these things in us. But for this lifetime, the Swabhava is directed towards one goal. And there if we an, get... Yeah. There is interesting, this question, why we attract something of the opposite, which actually obstructs us. Somebody said that, imagine that the world is the mirror in which you see yourself. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a partial knowledge. We want to calculate in, in the incalculable. We for, want to find the divine there where it's very difficult to find. We want to try that bhava of our own self-becoming in the conditions where it is impossible. That brings the most intense discovery, <laughs> the most obvious to the soul, how it works. Yes, you mm -hmm. always experience something of that too. Right. Because we are put in the opposite situation to the Swabhava so that we can face the challenges and allow the Swabhava to grow in all its intensity and fullness against the challenges. We want to use those challenges as fuel to the fire. Right, absolutely. And this is a very good uh, kind of comparison, Vedic comparison. As uh, Rurik, there was such a, a thinker, great thinker in Russia. He was the founder of Agni Yoga. He said, did you learn to appreciate the obstacles? <laughs> Because the obstacles are showing you where you have to go and try yourself out. It is there the field of action. And it's not only for you to figure out your swabhava working within you know, hostile circumstances, but also for the change of the world with your swabhava. You will be changing yourself, that mirror in which you see yourself as somebody else as an obstacle, and that obstacle is the field of action. So we are not going to escape it to find some comfortable place. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Forget about this from now on. <laughs> Just accept all the obstacles, all the difficulties as your field of work and apply that inner nature, inner drive, bhava, to that uh, and see what happens. It will be a miracle after miracle if you will do that. There are many such miracles. Yeah, they sometimes they cost a lot. They cost maybe the whole life and very, very difficult life for the physical, vital and mental, very uncomfortable, but for the soul, it's a treasure. Yeah, there is even uh, such belief that when the divine gives you everything, all the comforts, money, everything is given to you, it means uh, divine is not very interested in you. <laughs> it is when the divine takes away from you a lot. <laughs> and then there must be something, it pushes you to find the truth. Yeah? The most difficult circumstances are given to you to find the deeper you in all of it. There are many such stories in, in the Bible and in India also. Mother, somebody asked the mother, is it really true that all those who come to yoga, they will be taken away, their beloved, their most dear people will be taken away from them? She says, no, it's not like that. It's only with those who are chosen. <laughs> so here we are. So if you are chosen for some greater discovery, be ready. You know, it's, here, uh, I, yeah. here I'm wondering if I should share this. Mm. But, you know, I'll just share it because what you just said makes so much sense. When I used to live in India, I was working in the Gnostic Center, which is run by Amita Mehra. And she comes from a very good family. Her father was a general 
in the Indian army and uh, they had a beautiful home and she had a sister. Mm -hmm. So the sister visited Gnostic Center a couple of times, her parents visited and we had the honor to meet all of them. And then suddenly on the 1st of January, 1997, I think, or was it 98? Anyway, it was towards, uh, you know, that time. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going in a helicopter mm -hmm. from uh, one spot to another spot and the helicopter crashed and she lost her entire family in one go. And she, it was like such a shock to all of us that how could this happen to her? Why did it happen to her? She's the founder of the Gnostic Center. She's mother's child. She was Niro, she's Nirodha's, you know, protege. And uh, he's guiding all the movements here in the Gnostic Center. How could this happen to Amita that at one blow, her entire family, father, mother, and sister, and she was left alone. But she stood so strong through it all. You know, we were kind of shaken all around her. And then I started thinking that when mother left her body, at that time, even the ashram people, everybody was shaken, you know. So a tragedy like that shakes us. But like you said, the person is tested, is strong, and they have all these challenges against them which normal people, ordinary people cannot even think about, leave alone face. But they have in their life that, that quality, that strength to face it, overcome it, and still continue on, you know? And I saw that in her, and it, I, till today I can't forget that incident, you know, how she came through as so strong, as so brave. And... Uh, that's so you what, were you were with her that time, yes? Yes, we attended all the functions of that, you know, at that time that were held, the various... Uh, she told me the story, uh, yes. Um, uh, I think there, there are several things, yeah? One is for her, taking all the obstacles, which were actually a big obstacle for her to develop the Gnostic Center, were taken away. Uh, and new movement, new space was open up. Of course, for her, it was a big blow. It's like for, for Sri Aurobindo with death of his father. Can you imagine that he, he was late for the ship which sunk, which sank into the ocean? <laughs> and because he was on the list, father read that Sri Aurobindo that his uh, Aravinda is not coming home because the ship is sunk and he is on the list. He fell into depression and died. And when he came with the next ship, father was already dead. One obstacle is gone. It's a big obstacle, his father. And his love for his father was so strong. He says he cried twice in his life. This is when father died, and second time in when Marinalini Devi, his wife, died. His wife wanted to come. He was calling her to come to the ashram. He was already there in the ashram. And she was ready to go, but then she got sick, 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 and died. Young, young woman died on the way towards Shirobindo. And he said, when he came out from this news, he said, God, God knew how to hit me into the very heart. This is those who are chosen. But these people, his, his wife and his father could be a big obstacle for his work in the future. So they were taken away because he is chosen. And there is nothing wrong. That sacrifice is the divine sacrifice. <laughs> they are taken care of. There is no problem with that. Everything will be fine with them. There is something greater. Now, look at these wars, Kurukshetra. All these wars, which Sri Krishna explains, there was no other better way to do it other than to kill everyone. <laughs>
Well, just think about it. We are living in this world. We have to be ready to face it. Yes, yes, uh, Gita Shri. Sometimes things happen for the greater good. We just don't realize it at that moment in time because we are human beings. But now that we are on this path, one has to recognize that and just pray to the Divine Mother because everything happens for a reason. And when the obstacles are in, insurpassable, uh, difficult to, to deal with, then we call to the deepest, highest in us. And that is the fulfillment. These obstacles are needed. They are there. Otherwise, we will become lazy, really. I saw myself how lazy I became in Oroville stagnating for years, doing only on the surface things, really not being that who I should be, could be. Oh, I saw, and not only with me, with many ashramites also, how lazy and useless they became in every way. Because there is, they take for granted that presence. They cannot handle more of that presence because there is no capacity. There's no, so this, I, I give this example of the literature when the Gita was not available in Soviet Union. I told you already this. I rewrote everything with my hands. I have my handwritten library, you know, because these books are not available. And my friend had to fly some kind of 4,000, 5,000 kilometers away to some place to buy Gita when it was published. And it was published only 5,000 copies for the whole Soviet Union. So all the libraries took it. And he just for those copies, we were fighting. We were ready to give any money just to get one copy of some translation of the Gita. This is how we lived. And that intensifies the movement. It gathers all the forces of, of the being to be dedicated to this. You can't think of anything else. Poetry comes to you. The flame is kind of rising from your heart. And you can't but come and write, sit and write poetry in the night when nobody is there with, you know, alone somewhere in the Soviet Union where everybody is hostile towards the very idea of the divine. <laughs> and you feel so privileged to be with this presence, you know. And presence grows and grows, denying all that darkness. So this intensity of the obstacles are playing their role. It says, Sri Krishna says, when, when the adharma grows, when the darkness grows, I come as avatar to remove it, yes. to fight, because man cannot do it so anymore. So we are in this world, marvelous world of adventure to find the divine everywhere. So if we start applying it, really applying, remembering that we are here to do this, then that mirroring of obstacles becomes a very interesting opportunity. Oh, look, there is an obstacle. Let's go there <laughs> and apply the whole, you know, love for the divine. Let us see how it melts down and changes, and divine reveals its face. You know, it doesn't reveal immediately. Okay, that doesn't matter. I will again and again and again do it again. Because I, I don't depend on the, that kind of mirroring. I depend only on this flame. So these are the thoughts. Yeah, I'm sorry, not much of the Gita today. And if somebody wants else, since it is from Svabhava and we are to say, maybe I kind of didn't 
give everybody the opportunity to say. Today I've heard two different versions of the story of how a mother encountered the Bhagavad Gita when she was still a girl in Paris. And in one of them, it, it, uh, it took her six months to uh, fully realize the psychic being. And in the other story, um, it took her one month to, to let's see, to, um, she attained to the realization of the imminent supreme. That's on the Kiri Joshi archives. Yeah. Right, right. She was doing yeah. the yoga of the Gita. It's amazing, yeah? before coming to Sri Aurobindo. So Sri Aurobindo said she was born realized. But yes. Still she had to go through a process of evolution. So it, it, it kind of defies simplistic notions of what evolution is, especially for the, you know, avatars. Just like right. Sri yeah. Just like Sri Aurobindo, uh, having Krishna uh, descend into his body fully, permanently, when he was 54 years old, it, it defies the simplistic notion that avatars are, are, are fully realized from birth. Right. Yeah. You know, Rama and Krishna had their own gurus when they were young. Yeah, gurus are here only to uh, to trigger something on the surface, mm -hmm. so that to bridge something which is already there to the surface, to to secure that bridge, or to mm -hmm. say that it is possible. That's enough. Yeah, just to say it's possible, sure, you can do to, it. Yeah, to wake up that mm -hmm. swabhava. Yeah. The mother was like this also, yes, until, and she didn't know that she was the Divine Mother until Alma told her, but you are the Divine Mother. <laughs> and then everything came. It's amazing because the surface consciousness lives in its own kind of life, yeah, in its own field. Yeah. It yeah. needs this, not bridge, a kind of reminder, someone to tell you, that you can bring all that inner being uh, into the surface. And then, then language changes, you start speaking differently. All these prayers and meditations started to come. It's amazing how it is. It's really about the inner consciousness. Consciousness decides everything. All that faith, that Shraddha, what Shraddha you have, that you become. The mother Shraddha was only in the Supreme. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, she loved to be with Krishna. She loved to be with Sri Aurobindo, as she describes mm -hmm. the three stages. And then when Sri Aurobindo saw that she is leaning on him only and feels so comfortable with him, she said, I am not coming again. <laughs> then she had to call the Supreme and he appeared. And he, she, she heard the voice, first Krishna, then Sri Aurobindo, then me, then I. So there is a stages of development. That's why Krishna and Sri Aurobindo came together for that I to come, <laughs> to bring it faster towards us. We live in some kind of mythical world <laughs> and it is real for us more real than outer world yeah what is the outside so <laughs> wind blows yeah so it's okay yeah. hunger <laughs> disease pain death pleasure <laughs> pleasure like pain that's it that's all it's not enough All right. Somebody else on Swabhava has some thoughts to share? It would be interesting to hear if, in case. If not, then we can stop and continue next time. You think about it. It's a great thing to think. I cannot tell you my Swabhava, really. I know there was an adventure, curiosity to discover that there is no darkness.
I was even writing such a, a poetry that I thought when I will tear the veil, I'm translating from Ukrainian, tear the veil of lies, I will discover demons there, instead discovered the divine. So there is no demon behind the lie. <laughs> it's the divine, and the distortion is only the veil which is covering with the darkness, the crust. That's why every demon tries to, to resemble the divine, wants you to believe in his lies, because there is no other way to really live. So would you, can you say that demons in a way, the, you know, the Asuras and Rakshasas, they, they're actually sac making a great sacrifice to act in a way that is anti-divine. Yeah, and they are the veil, them. yes. They are the... But, but doing so postpones their own realization. Yes, but they're doing the divine work, yes. You know, there yeah. is a beautiful uh, uh, description of, of uh, maybe I already spoke to you about this, uh, Ramayana, Tamil Ramayana. Mm -hmm. And in Tamil Ramayana, all the gods are sitting together and they take roles. Yes? Uh -huh. Vishnu says, you will be this, you will be this. Uh, you will play the role of that. All the uh, uh, Apsarasas, uh, Gandharvas, uh -huh. gods, uh -huh. take different roles. I will be Vishnu, says Vishnu. I will be Rama, and we, my brothers, my closest to me will be these, these, these. So everybody, all the roles are given. And he says, but there will be one role which will be difficult to fulfill. <laughs> that... Uh, you will be hated in this world and the next forever. Mm -hmm. um, Ravana. No. No? Who, no. Who could do this for me, he asked. And everybody turned away, the closest to Vishnu. <laughs> Nobody wanted that role to be hated in this world and the next. Um, and one Apsarasa said, yes, I will do this for you. And she became Kaikei. Oh, uh -huh. That beloved love, life, wife, Kaikei, who, who actually created all this havoc and sent Rama to, to the forest and, and actually killed Dasharatha because Dasharatha said he will not live without, Kai, without Rama. And he loved her and trusted her most. And she used the trust and hit him into the very heart. And she did this for Vishnu because she loved him. This is the greatest lover mm. among all. She is hated forever and she did this for the Lord. So you can think of Asuras in that way also. Mm -hmm. They are not very happy. They have to, to, to get any pleasure out of that situation <laughs> for themselves, so, you know, but... I don't think they are, they the are waiting. Thing of, yeah. the, the amazing thing about that story is it, it, it's as if the scripts had already been written right. and the gods just chose which role they'd play. Yes. And it is so. It is so. In the highest plane, all the, all the scenarios are there and you can play with them as you like in time because this time narrowed down our time is not that time yeah and from that time you can take from ever, elsewhere from everywhere and combine in particular constellation here any event mm. with your will great all right we can stop here uh, we are always carried away mm. <laughs> a bit closer to the end less we read more talk and especially me cannot stop talking somehow now next time we will take a bigger portion of text and finish half of it at least mm. Mm. all right i will close the mantra oh.
sarve bhavantu sukhinaha sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet om shanti 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 Anyhow. Namaste. 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 Namaste.